the ball hikes. And then, you know, he saw me flash that slant. So he took that away. And then he came down to the check down with Travis Henry. And I was also anticipating that because I was quick enough to come off the slant to go and intercept that ball or at least have a big collision. And we ended up having a collision. And on this particular play, I end up on my back. And typically, after a big collision, you get up, celebrate. But on this particular play, I'm like, Keith, get up. I'm talking to myself. I'm laying on my back. I'm like, Keith, get up. And my body's not moving. I'm like, wow, this has never happened. And I'm like, you know, it's a very interesting feeling I felt I'll never forget that I could feel no pain. I couldn't move. And I knew I was in trouble. It's like, and I, I didn't understand that. I didn't have any pain, but in my mind, I'm like, Keith, you're in trouble. Hey folks, welcome back to the At The End Of The Tunnel podcast, where I share stories about people who've gone through a transformation of some sort that resulted in them finding their purpose, hence the title At The End Of The Tunnel. This is your host, Light Watkins, and my guest this week is a former NFL player named Keith Mitchell. Keith grew up in Texas, and like many kids in Texas, Keith dreamt of playing professional football. His parents weren't so hot on the idea because they didn't want him to get hurt, but he persisted. He put all of his focus on training and developing the skills to play linebacker at the highest level and cut to 10 years later, Keith is playing for the New Orleans Saints. In other words, his dream came true, but in his eighth season in the league, his parents' worst fear also came true as Keith found himself lying on the field after a play completely unable to move. And later, it was confirmed that he suffered a career-ending spinal contusion while making a tackle that he made a million times. And on paper, it appeared as though Keith's dreams were over. But little did he know, his real mission was just starting. While recuperating from the paralysis, Keith learned about yogic breathing. He began doing some yin yoga stretches. And he credits yoga with eventually helping him regain full movement in his body. Keith then went to Honduras to study with Dr. Sebi, whose alkaline plant-based diet plans have been known to heal all kinds of illnesses and diseases. And that's the point in which Keith changed his diet. He introduced his mom to Dr. Sebi. And get this, his mom's stage three breast cancer went into remission within three months with no chemo. Keith became a yoga teacher. He started the Light Up Foundation, which works with communities, schools, and organizations to introduce mindfulness, meditation, and movement with a yoga focus to children. The foundation also serves to educate our first responders, police and doctors, veterans, and people who suffer mental disorders. Keith has also adopted the playbook format from football to mindfulness practices, and he created the Mindfulness Playbook which is his first book. So needless to say, we had a fascinating conversation about expectations, pivoting your career, the importance of not playing small when you have a nonprofit, healing yourself with food, and so much more. So let's get to it, sit back, and we're going to go on a deep dive into the world of Mr. Keith Mitchell. Keith, thanks so much for joining the podcast. I'm super excited to talk to you, man. You and I go back a few years, but there's parts about your life that I'm not very familiar with. And the way I like to start off these conversations is talking about childhood. My icebreaker question for you is when you think back to little Keith growing up in Texas, what would you say your favorite toy or activity was as a child? Well, my favorite activity toy was a football. Growing up in Texas, We had the Dallas Cowboys. I grew up in the country, East Texas. It was like either riding horses, you know, wanting to be a cowboy or literally wanting to be a cowboy as a football player, you know. So those two dynamics of of what I was exposed to as a youth, and particularly with my father, my father, I consider him like an alpha male. My grandfather had a lot of strong, powerful men around me. So I wanted to kind of get their validation that I could be strong, I could be powerful too. So I kind of follow suit with that. And and that was my thing. What was it about football that 
attracted you? Did you see it as a great outlet for teamwork or for leadership or anything like that? Oh man, I wasn't that deep. So I didn't see it. <laughs> I didn't see it like that. How I, how I did see it was when I saw kind of like, I guess when you see the other you know rappers talk about the hustlers in the community, when I saw the NFL players come through, it was like, everybody was like, oh man, this is a star. This is, you know, you brought the whole, the whole city came out to see them. And like, they looked at them in a different way. And I'm like, you know, as a kid, you're like trying to identify, like, I want that. <laughs> I don't know what that is, but I want that. And I want that baller, have- that baller lifestyle. Yeah. And it's not, and you don't really know as a kid about the extent of the lifestyle. It's just that presence. When you show up, it's like, everybody is looking at you in a different way. And I felt I wanted that. Was there a particular player that you really looked up to? Not really. But, you know, again, like I said, the Cowboys uh, in the city, you know, you had Drew Pearson, Tony Dorsett. You had Tom Landry as a coach. You had Two Tall Jones, Harvey Martin. They had a lock, Lockhart. Like, you had all these types of characters, and, and they were winning. And it was just celebrated. And, you know, the city, again... How they played is how the mood of the city went. And it was mm-hmm. just pretty interesting. And, and, and for whatever reason, I can always talk about my family's church. You know, we were my family's bunch of preachers in, in the church and in, in the family. And we would always be out just in time to catch those football games when they would start. <laughs> so they made it a priority. It's like the whole world existed around this concept of football, you know? So I was just born in that culture. How was your athletic acumen when you were a kid? Not so good <laughs> initially, you know. And then at the same time, my my mother wouldn't let me play. It, it took a lot of convincing for her to let me play the game. So a lot of the things I was doing that I didn't know then, but I know now when you talk about, for instance, manifestation, you know, manifesting, you know. I would envision a lot of times I would see the game and then at the, at the end of the game, go outside and try to portray it in my mind as I'm throwing the football up to myself because I was only a child for a long time. So I'm throwing the football up to myself and envisioning myself like making a play in a uniform on that level. And that was what I was training my mind to perceive at that time. You didn't have neighborhood kids that you played with? I did every now and again, but like for the most part, I was just kind of isolated. You know, my parents very, you know, they sheltered me very, and I understand why now, not knowing so much then, but they kind of just sheltered me. And then when I had the opportunity to be with my family, because we have a big family in East Texas, because we moved from Tyler, Texas to Dallas, South Oak Cliff, just the exposure in the community was just different. So I was more or less kind of sheltered and, and, and more to myself. I was more isolated in that sense private school, everything like that. So I didn't really have local friends as a kid, I guess. And what was your family life like? My mother and father have been married 45 years. If not 46, I lose count. You know, they're still together. (laughs) And even as they were still together, there's still a lot of things I had to heal from a traumatic standpoint as well. However, by having the father in at home, it really shaped my perspective, my perspective. It, it just, my father raised me tough. You know, he's a military guy on top of that, a uh, preacher. I was raised with extreme amount of discipline and, you know, that discipline, you know, has translated into all the things I've been able to do in my life. Even as when I was going through it in the beginning, I didn't see it as a compliment. I didn't see it as something that was beneficial. I, I, I felt it as poor me, like, you know, I don't, <laughs> does he even love me? Like, you know, but it's like, but that dynamic over time raised me to be tough. You know, I was raised tough. So I'm tough, you know, in that sense. Yeah. Do you remember any of the sayings or the philosophies that your dad would harp on when you were a kid? Because everybody's dad, I feel like has things that they would say, little phrases and cliches and stuff. My dad used to say, you get what you inspect, not what you expect. And he would say, you can't, he said, he was a lawyer, my dad. He said, you can't get away with anything. All you can do is increase the lag time. And I always remembered those, those philosophies. Did your dad have anything like that? I think he had, but they were not so deep in that sense, which is interesting when it comes to that 
type of male, that alpha male. And I'm not saying, you know, your father wasn't that, but typically what you find, what I find in myself as well, that construct of a man is not so articulate mm. when it comes to the compassion aspect, you know. Now, when they read scripts, because my father had master degrees, my father's never worked for anybody besides himself, even to this day. He's retired, but he still has residual from his business. My father just never gave me those. You know, I had the old cliches from the Bible, <laughs> you know, be don't be caught in the wrong place at the wrong time. You know, stuff like that, that, in my opinion, don't mean anything, but they're stories. But never really cliches to really hold on to like that from my, mm-hmm. my father. When did you take football seriously? Well, again, when I convinced my family, you know, I was actually, I was a small kid. Like my father's five, seven, my mother's five, seven. My father's 135 pounds, 140, something like that. I don't know how I got to this point being six, three at that time, you know, getting up to 260 when I was playing. I don't know where that came from. However, I committed myself and I, I started a regiment of running. Like I started running five miles. I started doing push-ups. I heard Herschel Walker had this thing. He would watch TV as a child. And he's like, well, during the commercial breaks, he started doing push-ups. I started doing push-ups. You know, I started doing whatever it would take to like build my body to convince my family, my mother in particular, this in this case, to let me participate. So that really evolved around when I was 13. Were you like secretly plotting to play but you didn't want to tell your mother oh man of course I was plotting and it was no secret I mean I was just like in the you know I guess I always say this thing you know for me it was like church it was like we were at church for Monday night Tuesday night Wednesday night sometimes Thursday Friday Saturday choir rehearsal Sunday Sunday school, Sunday night service. I was like, man, I, I just want to break away from just going to church. And like, we were actually, the church was kind of close to the um, stadium. So Friday nights I would go out because I played the drums in the church. Actually, I, be, I began to realize if I'm going to be here, I want to do something. I'm not going to be so bored. So I'm, I started playing the drums. I'd learn myself how to play the drums. But then during the certain breaks, I would go out and just hear the crowd and the stadium and the lights, that's that's just thing was really just calling me. And like I said, I convinced them to let me play. And that's when I began to really take it serious because I was so far behind the curve when it came to talent. It was just, I had the desire, I had the mental, which is actually is the most important fundamental, having the mental, because so many are talented, but uh, I had to develop the physical, like quick, fast, in a hurry, if I wanted to participate. And what position did you start with? Actually, you know, I started at receiver. I was a receiver. And the, the funniest thing is they, they would put me out there because I was kind of scared. I was, kinda, you know, you hear those pads, click, clack, you know, like in Texas, you know, they hit hard. I'm sure like in Alabama too. So, you know, I was a little attentive, you know, I was a little shy out there, you know. And so they had me play receiver. And I, and I think they put me out there because I was intimidated because I had a little bit of size but they never threw me the ball. So when I got to my sophomore level, I was introduced to a a coach and he put me on defense and he began to give me the tools I needed to play the game for real. And those tools, it's like, it's like he taught me in a sense of like a switch to turn this switch on and all the frustration, confusion that I had in my life, trying to figure things out. I could just put it all into what I was doing is transforming as this linebacker to just hit people and hit them as hard and as aggressive as I could. And it began to be my canvas. You know, it began to be how I dealt with my frustrations, my unanswered questions. I began to put that into an action and I went full steam ahead. Was this the first coach you, you really connected with? Well, yeah. The, the first one I had as a freshman, what he did tell me that really stuck with me, he gave me the question, where do you see yourself in five years? He gave me that question. And 
that question really hit home for me because I never thought about it. And when I thought about it, I re- I began to realize, well, so five years coming, I need to start planning. Like I need to start putting something together so I can have something, you know, again, I'm not knowing how to articulate myself at that time, but I'm knowing that I need to plant some seeds so they can harvest for me in five years. And so I began to, once I really learned football and how I mm-hmm. could click with it and how I could play the game, I was like, I wanted every school in the country to, to recruit me to play football for them in college. That was my goal out mm-hmm. of nowhere. Like I'm not, not even at this point, I wasn't even starting, but that began to be my goal. I wanted to have every school in the country recruit me to play for them. And again, a kid thinking like that, who, I mean, who does that? No one in my family played the game, but this was my thought as a kid that I could do it. You're the scrawny little kid. You're afraid of the ball. Did you articulate that goal to anybody else? And if so, how did they react? Well, I I did tell some friends. Yeah. I got a bunch of people laughing at me in particular, like who I was playing with my teammates, you know, it was a lot of teasing like that. So they were like, you know, you can't even do this. You can't even do that. I, I heard all the, all that kind of talk. But once I connected with this coach though, he got my mind straight. He got my mind in tune to this game and began to build the fundamentals that I need to play this game the way I needed to play it. You started practicing as a linebacker. What are some of the things you have to be good at to be a really world-class linebacker? Well, you have to have aggression. You have to have aggression. You have to have instinct. And really, it was like a linebacker defensive end kind of concept. And you have uh-huh. to... You have to be relentless because in some cases when you're really good, they had they put two, three people on you and you have to overcome that to get to the quarterback. It's like one of the most priceless positions on the field. In some cases, it's even the quarterback of the defense. So some sometimes my position in the pros, I have to line up everyone. Like, you know, it's like and make adjustments when they go in motions, you're making adjustments. We have the same plays. We go to a play with three or four calls in the pros that is to offense we have Mm -hmm. checks we have a lot of people don't even know this and we'll i'm sure we're going to talk about this later but we have our own language we have our sign Mm -hmm. language we have all these types of things that it's like the military you have like silent codes that you exactly And, and we have to change them all the time because they're constantly trying to steal our calls in high school you're introduced to a playbook do you have a playbook in high school or is it just plays you have to memorize from practice in high school, it's just basic plays that you have to memorize. And you basically have your core plays that you run like every week. And the things that you're good at, typically, we moved from Oak Cliff to the suburbs in Garland. And I went to the school called Garland Lakeview. We're a 5A team, you know, meaning we had over 6,000 people in our, in our school. And so we had our plays that we ran every week. And typically, you base your plays on the talent that you have on the team. And so we had some talent. Actually, my freshman year, our varsity team actually went pretty far. They went to the third round of the playoffs and beat some really big teams. Like, you know, and it put us on the map. Like, you know, who's this school? Lakeview. And it set, it set another, like a precedent, if you will, even of like winning and the ta- talent level that we had coming up. And I just happened to be there at the right time as a freshman to see that, like, wow, to dream. Like, and actually our team was um, like every other team in the eighties, a dream team. <laughs> so, so like in 88 actually, but they, yeah, they set a precedent of winning. Were there any plays that were based around your specific talent? Not, not that I really remember My team basically kind of let me go. Like I could line up every, any side of the ball I wanted, wherever I wanted. And I could just go. I had the reins to like just just navigate the way I wanted and get after the quarterback. And I would have like hundred some tackles, twenty sacks, all district, all state, you know, all American. I was my senior year. I was defensive player of the year. You know, amongst some really amazing talents. You know, and again, I'm just this kid from East Texas who just had a had a dream, a vision that I could do it. What do you think the difference was in you and all the other kids who were playing, all the other good kids who were playing? Like, what made you so, how did you, how did you rise to that level so quickly? Well, I'm telling you, I, I, mindset. Mindset is, is huge. I always say 
the game is about 20% physical and 80% mental. That's really what separates players from the other. Because, you know, when you look at the statics, you know, okay, 6'3", 250, you, you could run a decent 4'5". I ran a 4'4", four, four, four was my fastest, those who know the 40-yard times and, and so forth. But the thing is that there's layers to it. Here's the thing. There's players who could play well in practice. There's players who could not translate that practice play to the game. It's like we have this saying, don't be afraid to be great. A lot mm-hmm. of people had stages of fear of being and excelling. And I didn't have any fear with that. I wanted that. This is who I, I was, you know? And, and yeah, and so I didn't run from that. I ran right into that. Would you be able to tell that someone didn't have the right mindset compared to your mindset? Well, I could see a lot of things. I could see their preparation. I could see, Mm -hmm. you know, it's something as slight as like their jersey number, how they saw themselves, you know. What's the jersey number thing? Well, jersey number thing is like my number was 23, you know. Okay. (laughs) <laughs> I, you know, like I, you know, you know, like the, you know, a lot of the players who wore the single digits, it's like they thought that about themselves. Twenty three, I was like Michael Jordan, you know, uh-huh. the goat. Like I want to be that, and whatever I do, and so it does tell a lot about a player. Like in the pros, you see a receiver who has a number fourteen. Well, they weren't banking on him making the team. <laughs> just gave him a number. You know what I'm saying? It's like, so it's like that dynamic does play a part. It's like, it's, it's all mindset. It's all, how do you see yourself? Which is so interesting. It's interesting when you look at it, when you translate it to what we talk about in the meditation or mindfulness world. So you were a hundred percent convinced you were going to play in the pros at that point in your life. Well, yeah, because when you commit, well, you can't have, as soon as you begin to have a backup, well, then you're already lost. And were you recruited by a bunch of schools? I achieved that. I had every school in the country come into my house to recruit me to play football. It's so funny. I, I tease my parents this, and I don't know, you may get a kick out of this. I've never seen white people come to my house. <laughs> that was the first time I had white people come to the house where uh-huh. I had coaches come to the house. <laughs> So it's like, yeah, I had every school from Nebraska, Oklahoma, Michigan. And I would, what I did, I, I, every time I would get letters, I started getting letters for recruitment. And as my junior year came around, cause that's when they could approach me. So I would, what I would do every letter I would, I would get, I would put it on the wall. And uh-huh. by the time my senior year came, my whole room was filled with letters from every school in the country. I ate, I slept, I woke up into that whole environment that I created, that container, like that's, that was my mindset. That's what I was doing. What was the funniest or oddest or weirdest thing that happened during that recruiting process when the coaches would come over? Well, you know, just their, their recruitment there. You know, some of the guys who came, uh, like Marvin Lewis, who, you know, went on to coach in the pros. A lot of them went on to coach in the pros from that time just the engagement, like to believe it, like, wow, I have this school wanting me to play. I have Notre Dame coming. I have, which you got Lou Holtz. I had Texas A&M. I had USC. Like these guys like wanted me to come play for them. That's like, wow. You know, it came to pass, which introduced me to possibility very young. Why did you choose Texas A&M? Well, here's the thing. I, I narrowed it down to two schools and it was USC and Texas A&M. And both because they had great defenses. They were known for their linebackers, you know, Junior Seau coming out of SC. So many great linebackers that they had. And at that time, Texas A&M had the wrecking crew. It was like linebacker university. Yeah, it was like linebacker <laughs> you. And I was like, man, you know, if I'm, I always put myself, I want to go play with the best. I want to mm-hmm. go be with the best. However, like I mentioned earlier, that sheltering that my parents did with me it kind of made me a little lenient about going to California that young because I mm-hmm. wasn't, ex- you know, me in California, me in LA at that time, as, you know, sheltered coming. I'm like, I think I'm mature enough to live in LA now, <laughs> but at that time, maybe not so much, but you know, so I, I was like, okay, I'm going to stay close to home. I'm going to go to Texas A&M and then we're going to post it up there. And, 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 and it began. 
had they bought into the whole football career thing at that point, your parents? Oh, yeah, because here's the thing I didn't mention. So when I first started, my parents, they both work. So it, it kind of goes into that story. You know, well, I had to walk five miles every day, <laughs> you know, get to practice. And it's true, you know, in triple digit weather, you know, it's like, how am I going to get there? Like, it's like, okay, well, I didn't have a car. And, you know, the only way I was going to go, and I didn't have very many friends, like I mentioned. So I had to go. I had to commit. And so what I did, we had two-day practices in the summer. And so I would walk in. I would walk to the morning practice, walk back. Walk back to the evening practice and come back. And, you know, sometimes I lucked up. If I got a ride with someone or my mother came home early, she could pick me up. But that's how committed I was to achieving this goal. And, and this was my vision. And like, mm-hmm. it was, it was just, this was my only option. This is what I gave myself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Talk about the speed of the game once you got to college versus what you were experiencing in high school with a hundred tackles and sacks and all of this stuff. Was it the same kind of deal? Yeah. You know, the, the speed of the game. Yeah. I mean, each tier it jumps and in the playoffs, we would in, in, in high school, we, we made it to the first round of the playoffs. We played both years, my junior and senior year, we played Marshall, which, you know, Marshall, Texas had these big East Texas boys, you know, the speed. They had tremendous amounts of speed. And I noticed a jump then in the playoffs. Like, and then when he went to college, it's like a whole nother jump because you're coming in. I came in at 18 years old and these guys are like 21, you know, 22 you know, mm-hmm. f- fifth year seniors, things like that. Mm-hmm. And they're on, they're, they're huge because they got a whole training regiment they've been doing that we haven't been doing, an mm-hmm. eating regiment they've been doing. I'm like, here, here I go, back to square zero. You know, these kids are making that jump early now, coming out of college and playing in the pros. But like, it was a little different back in my time. And we had to go through another development. So each stage, you have to go into another development. Each stage, you're tested. Like, okay, I did all this. Now I'm back to the bottom. I'm mm-hmm. back into square one. What are you going to do? And so I had the formula and I committed to that formula again. The same formula that worked for you in high school also worked for you in college. And or did you have to find new tools to help supplement what you had used in, in high school? I had to recruit new tools because I left high school. I was 190. And then here I go, you know, because again, all the college is recruiting you. They're like, oh, yeah, son, you can start for me. You'll be able to start. You'll be in a position to start. And by the time when I got to AM, i I'm like looking down the, the line. <laughs> You're LB6. <laughs> <laughs> if not, it's true. I was like eighth, you know? <laughs> right. And they're all huge, you know? So I was like, okay, this is what I got to do. Because again, getting there, they like, okay, once you get the scholarship, that's the first piece. Now you got to stay there. Mm-hmm. And now you got to excel because how your performing is going to affect your mindset of Mm -hmm. being there, you know? So they all go together as a student athlete. And so Mm -hmm. I'm looking at these guys like, man, how can I compete? You know, it's so funny because, you know, we would go up against lineup. A lot of tight ends would be like 285 pounds, 270 pounds. And they gave me the, this is award. I didn't, I'm not happy. I got this award as a, as a rookie, as a freshman, but they call it the child abuse award. (laughs) <laughs> so I got that award because I was just getting my butt kicked and I had to develop really quickly. And uh, so I, I put myself to a test and I, and I created a form. I created a new formula that I felt could get me there in college. Talk about being introduced to the playbook. How did you adapt to that? And what were the challenges with that? Well, here's the thing. When you adapt a playbook, you have to really begin to understand the game. In, mm-hmm. uh, in high school, you don't really understand the game. Like you got to know the rules of the game. You got to know like so many aspects of the game. You got to know what other people are doing because you're engaging, you're interacting with your position to other people. So they got to be accountable. We got to be accountable to each other. Who's holding contain? Who's not? If we're if we're going and running games, like we have different games that we would we would put on to different stunts we would do. We have to be communicative with each other to work together, things like that. It, it's just, it integrates a whole concept. Like I was going to like a calculus Cal one in college. Well, mm-hmm. football one oh one was happening at the same time. And it was introduced me to the game that I had seen as a child. I had even played on the high level in, in, in Texas high school football, 
but it was a whole nother game in at that time, Southwest Conference, Big 12, and so forth, now SEC. How long did it take you to under, to learn learn all of that in college? Well, see, that's another thing. You don't have time. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta like you got you gotta get it right away. And that, that's why I'm so compelled with transformation. Uh-huh. Because again, I had to learn a whole different language, a whole different scheme. And I didn't have time to like like contemplate, well, maybe should I, can I? Uh no, you don't have that kind of time. It's like you're mm-hmm. in it or you're, you're going to be on the sideline. So again, you have to commit and through that commitment, it just, you know, you had to re-up and recruit, like you mentioned, new formulas, new, new attributes that you could gain to excel. But at what time in your college career does one, does an athlete know that they're possibly, there's a very good chance they're going to be drafted? Well, before drafting, you got to realize if you can even play the game on that level. And, you know, my coach, I had, a, you know, all these, I have these Southern coaches, you know, we had this terminology that, you know, they would say that dog a bite, or you could see, you could see like glimpses of like, okay, like, that person can get it done. You know, that, that person got something that's interesting, that's unique. You begin to see, cause every player has their uniqueness that stands out in certain things that they do. And then another thing about it is how consistent can you be with it? Cause there's a whole nother mechanism to get on the field, the coaches have to trust you. Meaning mm-hmm. they have to go through trial and error with you to make sure that you're going to be accountable with your playbook. You're going to be not just accountable to your playbook, you're going to be accountable to your teammates. Like, cause you know, if I'm holding contain, I got 10 people expecting me to hold contain. When I let, when I let that go, I don't just disappoint myself. I just, I disappoint the whole structure. So you begin to realize how, again, they're all interactive and how it goes together. So you build that through a lot of practices and we would have the, the level that, of talent that we had at AM and the practices. Oh, man, I think I think if I if we didn't practice so hard, I probably would have played longer. <laughs> we used to go at it, though. A lot of hitting. What was your unique thing on, on the field? Well, I was just adamant about making plays. My goal, like when, when, when it came down to recruitment, like I, I noticed every team had this highlight reel. Mm-hmm. And uh, I thought it was such an amazing thing. I was like, I want to make the highlight reel. I want to make the highlight reel. And then I had another thought after that, that when they would come to College Station or wherever we would go play, they had to come through me to beat us. They have to, they have to deal with me to, to beat us. And again, those are things that I learned that came true for me in high school formula. I just leveled it up. New formula in mm-hmm. college football and, and, and where, the, where, the, where the best of the best put it down. What year did you declare for the draft? I left college in, what, 96, mm-hmm. 96. And interesting to think enough about my story, even on top of that, because I became, I was a Southwest Conference, All-America, well, All-Conference in the Southwest Conference. I was All-Conference in the Big 12. We moved to the Big 12. I was also my senior year AP All-American. So in comparison to all the great players in college football, I was I was one of the greats, you know. We played uh, Michigan in the Alamo Bowl. I was defensive MVP of that game. They had Woodson. They had some really great players on that Michigan team, and we kicked that butt. But however, when I went to the pros, I was projected to be a high pick, but I didn't get drafted. I didn't mm-hmm. get drafted. And the interesting thing about my story even as, as well is when um, the seventh round came, because there's seven rounds in the draft, so Bill Cowher, who was the coach of the Pittsburgh Steelers, he called, he called and, and you know, and he was like, well, I'm thinking about drafting you. And, and it's like, and, you know, I knew who I was. I knew I could play the game. And he, he said, because he said, I'm thinking about it. And I was already not really, I was in my emotions and it really wasn't setting well with me about what happened with me falling in the draft. I was like, coach, I think you'd be better off picking someone else. And uh, sure enough, he did. He picked Mike Adams out of Texas, University of Texas, and he drafted him. And I go undrafted. So the draft is over. You Were you at home? Did you have a party? Your people were over? You guys were all watching TV? Like, what was yeah. the vibe like? I had people, because I was expected to be drafted. I, mm-hmm. you know, 
I did everything, as they say, I did everything right. I did everything I was supposed to do. I, I played my role as a college player to a T and come draft time, I didn't get drafted. So mm. again, new obstacle, new opportunity, new challenge. Sure enough, Coach Mike Dicker calls. And again, Cowboys, you know, 85 Bears. I know who he is. I feel this anyway. And, and he says, son, I don't know what happened with you in the draft, but I think you can play and I want you to come to New Orleans and play for me. And I, I did my own contract my rookie year. And I came, I went to New Orleans. I was like, well, if it's, it's close enough to home, if it doesn't work out, just come back. Meaning you didn't have a sports agent or anything like that. You like. I had a sports agent, but how it happened with the, with being a free agent in the free agent market, not being drafted is like, you have a basic contract that you sign for. And I think my signing bonus. So the contract, my, my rookie year contract was $131,000. I think I had $8,000 signing bonus that I negotiated, uh, whatever. And you know, it is what it was. And then I came in, as a rookie, became a starter. Were you on the practice squad at first and you just kind of worked your way up and clawed your way up to becoming a starter? No, I came in day one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I came in day one. <laughs> with I, a chip on your shoulder. With a chip angry. Because I, you know, I, mentioned, I, I mentioned where I began to cultivate using my anger, unanswered questions, putting my frustration on the field. And my coach who, who initiated that with me and learning that switch and the pros, interesting thing with that switch, actually, I learned this in college as well. You don't turn that switch off because mm-hmm. it's patterns at this point and how you do things is how you do things, mm-hmm. which is very interesting when it comes to the psychology of sports and doing some of the things that we talk about with meditation and mindfulness. Looking back now, after having spent something like eight years in the pros, why do you suppose you weren't drafted? What were you missing? When it comes to being coachable, I had some problems. I had a lot of things. And again, it goes into my childhood. A lot of things that happens in a very or highly disciplined situation. It's like you can only hit something so hard so long. At some point, you got to tell it why you're hitting it, why you're being so hard on it. I think it's the balance that I was missing. My father was very hard on me, but he never explained why he was hard on me. He would push me in certain ways to make me this alpha or, you know, to, to, so it creates consequences. It's the ripple effect. So I began to oppose authoritative positions in my life and particularly Mm -hmm. with coaches and how they would, you know, do things with me. So I had problems when it came to be coached and maybe that could have been it. When you brought the question up, those things come out to my mind because I really did a lot of things that I wanted to do in college. I didn't have, you know, I didn't, I had, they, they let me do what I wanted to do. And I think a lot of reasons was that because I was good enough and what else are you going to do? You got your best player who's not really coachable. I, as you know, but so maybe that was it. I don't know. However, when I went to the pros, say, so for instance, the position I played in college was like a hybrid linebacker position. So I would rush the quarterback, and that's basically what I did. I very little, you know, did very little dropping in coverage to cover tight ends, running backs, and so forth. Now, interesting thing enough, when I look at Bill Cowher and the Pittsburgh Steelers, that scheme fit me the best, but I was mm-hmm. in my emotional state. I didn't really realize and see it that way. However, going to New Orleans, they're more like a traditional linebacker position where I had to learn football all over again, like a whole nother one-on-one. I had to learn how to cover running backs. We got like Ricky Williams and people like that in our camp. I had to learn how to cover tight ends. I never covered tight ends before in my life. I had to cover receivers in some cases. So I had to learn football all over again. And I had this amount of time, this amount of uh, error, margins for error, because you were talking about the best of the best. And so I had to learn. How How did you do it? How did you do it so quickly? You have to surrender to it. I'm here. I know I can play. I know I can run. I know I can hit. I know I can do the base fundamentals of it. I just have to be open to learning. Did you have a coach that worked with you one-on-one on the off hours to help you drill these different plays with these with the tight ends and, and whatnot? No. I had, but the thing is, I had a good coach. He, he was a, his name was uh, Rick Ventura. 
like I just had to again be open to receive the information. So when he mm. would teach other people, I'd be in tune to listen. The little techniques that I had, like you know, we had people like in our camp, Jack Del Rio, who's you know went on to be head coach of other teams. I had Winston Moss, who was a linebacker who was with the Packers or Tampa Bay for a long time and went on to be head coaches who were the intricate coaches that would help us learn technique and things like that. But I had to get it on my own. And I had, to, it was lights, camera, and action. I had to do it in the most extreme, stressful moments ever, you know, with the best of the best. And this is, again, why I'm so convinced that transformation is possible. It's just allowing yourself to be open to receive the information. You basically now at this point achieved the dream, right? So what's the difference in playing for the fun of it versus playing for the sport of it versus playing for your livelihood, your salary? Is there a qualitative difference in how you approach the game? Oh, yeah, definitely. Because how you're perceived, it's like a business. It's like it's you got real situation. You're talking about real money. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you're talking about real money. And it's and like there's no days off. That's where that state, those statements come. No days off. I didn't have sick days. You don't have sick days. Even if you're sick, you're there. So you just have to apply yourself. It's like, again, what do you want out of it? And I saw a lot of the guys who were first rounders, you know, and because they got the big money in the beginning, they could be baby. And a lot of them were baby their whole careers. However, I didn't get that opportunity. So again, it began to shape how I saw the game and how I prepped for the game. Yeah, it just laid a foundation for me that I just stayed with the whole time. I was like, it was just a student of the game. And mm-hmm. I did everything. I called plays. I lined everyone up like I was a quarterback of the defense. What was your mindset like at this point? Now you've become the guy who is the baller, the player. You know, you're going back to the neighborhood, seeing the kids are watching you now. Oh, my God, Keith Mitchell's here. Yeah. He's with the, the the New Orleans Saints or the Houston. Did you feel happy or did you feel successful or how did you feel inside? Well, yeah, definitely. It's an interesting feeling. It's a, it's a feeling that you accomplish something and people appreciate it. And, um, you know, to set out a dream as a child is profound. Like, again, it's like a lot of people speak the word possibility, but they've never really experienced possibility. So once you experience something, you can't not unexperience it. And so it gets you and creates a whole nother range of mindset for possibility and what that can look like for you. Mm-hmm. So I guess what I'm I'm saying that to say, well, by my second, third year, I was getting voted into the for the Pro Bowl. And the Pro mm-hmm. Bowl is is your peers, your coaches, the fans. And they were putting me in the position to be considered one of the best in the game. By year eight, you're traded to Jacksonville. You now have been in the game long enough. It probably has slowed down, slowed down a lot for you. So you're, you're able to like play with more precision and more intuition and all of these things. And then you get to this, what is it, the second game of the season? Yes. First, yes. first home game? Yes. Talk about that. What happened? Well, before I talk about that, really, I want to go into when, when you look at the game, what you begin to realize is, granted, guys are big, they're strong, they're fast but you do begin to access more angles to the game. One Mm. of the things that was most profound for me from college, I had more of a linear perception of the game. So it was more like here, like straight ahead. And then when I got to the pros, this one veteran, he taught me how to put my fingers here in the front and just gauge it to my peripheral. And so when you can take care, you can, you can take in consideration the peripheral angles. Now I can access more angles to get to the ball. So even as I'm fast, with these new angles that I can access, I appear faster. Mm. Yeah. Just not checkers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so now, now in Jacksonville, you know, again, I, Jack Del Rio was one of the position coaches I mentioned who was in our, my rookie year Saints camp. He got his first head coaching job. And so we knew each other from there. So when he got his job, he wanted me to come play for him. So I I signed up. I said, okay, let's do the deal and went to Jacksonville. And 
it was very interesting because I was known for making and scoring touchdowns and like, I, you know, a lot of sacks and big plays, period. And so we we're playing Buffalo. Drew Bledsoe was the quarterback. We had played them back in 98 when he was in New England. And I had intercepted him on a route that I thought they were going to be running that game. And so I took it for 50 yards when he was with Belichick with New England. And so he's in Buffalo now. We're in Jacksonville. I'm thinking I'm seeing the setup for that same play. It's a three by mm-hmm. one, three receivers to the, to the, to the field, one in the boundary. And I know they isolate me with the backside with the running back. So they're either going to isolate me with the backside running back, or they're going to try to throw that backside uh, slant. And so I'm seeing that. And then I'm seeing that running back. And so the ball hikes and then he saw me flash that slant. So he took that away. And then he came down to the check down with Travis Henry and I was also anticipating that because I was quick enough to come off the slant to go and intercept that ball or at least, you know, have a big collision. And we ended up having a collision. And on this particular play, I end up on my back. And typically, you know, after a big collision, you get up, celebrate. But on this particular play, I'm like, Keith, get up. I'm talking to myself. I'm laying on my back. I'm like, Keith, get up. And my body's not moving. I'm like, wow, this has never happened. And I'm like, you know, it's a very interesting feeling I felt I'll never forget that I could feel no pain. I couldn't move. And I knew I was in trouble. It's like, and I I didn't understand that. I I didn't have any pain. But in my mind, I'm like, Keith, you're in trouble. When we as casual recreational viewers of football watch a game on TV, they'll in a play like that happens where a guy is laid out. They'll show the replay. Right. And you'll see, oh, the guy twisted his ankle. What would we have seen on that replay of you making that hit with the running back that would explain why you were laid out? I don't even know if it would explain why I was laid out. But as I go and hit, I notice my teammate, the, the other linebacker comes in and he's trying to hit the running back. But he also hits me. So I hit the running back, big collision. And then my teammate hits me another collision within that one collision and now I'm on my back and then as I'm laying down my hand is up but it's like not moving like my body is just froze like like I jolted my nervous system I was diagnosed with a spinal contusion it's like my body was just like in this paralyzed shock and Mm -hmm. it wouldn't let go it didn't do that for a long time actually for about a month so I was diagnosed with a spinal contusion I wake up in the hospital the doctors are there sitting that they don't know, you know, I'm, I've been told my whole career that doctors have all the answers and they're sitting there looking at me like, I don't know. I haven't seen this before. So I don't know if you're going to be able to walk. I don't know if, but my mindset is, will I be able to play? You know, I'm not even thinking about walking, which I'm not even thinking about really my health. It's about, I've known myself to be this role, this character as a, as a football player. And this is who I identify with. I'm looking at trying to hold on to it while it's, Actually, it's leaving me at some point, I guess. So I'm having that realization in the hospital, and it's, it's, a, it's a crazy experience. It was definitely a crazy experience for me. You also mentioned feeling embarrassment and shame when you were lying there in front of all the fans. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, you know, in practice, what we would do, because we would always have injuries, you know, and I always looked at injuries as being weak. You know, it's like, you know, coming under Mike Dicker, he had this statement, you know, you can't make the club in the tub, you know. So I stayed out of the training room. Like a lot of times mentally, you can allow yourself not to be injured, not to be hurt by mentally just, I'm not, you know, I broke probably nine out of 10 fingers. I, you know, dislocated elbows, hyper extended knees, two operations on my feet, I, you know, all kinds of things, concussions. But I just didn't let myself be hurt. You know, I didn't even wear a mouthpiece my whole career because I had to talk so much. And not just all that talking was play calling either. That was a lot of talking trash. (laughs) I was a good trash talker. (laughs) So a lot of people would get injured and we would, in practice, what we would do, they would say, move it up 10. And like the whole team would just march up 10 yards. And whoever's injured, they've forgotten about. They're like back there with trainers. And we were like, whatever. So you begin to get a a psychology around like that's weakness or that's, you know, something else. And it's like, so when it happened to me, I realized that, man, get me out of here. I don't want to be seen this way. 
You know what I'm saying? I don't want to be seen like weak and I don't want to be seen like vulnerable. And mm-hmm. so get me the hell out of here. I kept saying it like my body couldn't move. And they were like, we can't move you because we don't know what's wrong with you. I'm like, I don't care. Get me to, you know, I'm like, get me the hell out of here. So they kept me there about 45 minutes because they, I wasn't moving. And so finally they just lifted me up and carried me out and took me to the hospital. Was there any kind of crowd reaction that you remember when they were carting you out of there? I don't remember, maybe, but you're not thinking about that. I, I, at that time, I wasn't. I, I know we have a new approach to it now, but I wasn't thinking about that. I was like, man, like, you know, I'm, I'm like pissed off that I'm injured. You know, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm like, what the heck is this happening to me? You know, because I'm feeling invincible. Like I, my body is like, I can take, you know, tremendous amount of, of pain and like, and, and wear and tear. I've been doing it for my whole life. So I'm looking down at myself because I'm feeling my body let me down. I don't know whatever psychology I had in my mind at that time, but that's what's going in my mind. So what's the prognosis for spinal contusion? Are we talking surgery? Are we talking, what were the doctors talking about? Rehab? Really wanting to be cautious with what we were dealing with because at that time, unlike now, there's so many protocols around the spine and and you know these types of things this was like probably one of the newer cases with it you know even though we had spinal cord injuries previous but it's just not like it's in detail now so they didn't really know what to do they were wanting they they did suggest doing operations but i didn't feel comfortable with them doing operations you know from from their opinion so i wanted to go i always had my own doctor my agent i was with lee steinberg at that time probably the premier agent in, in the industry at that, at that point. And so I had my doctor in Florida, I would go, they sent me down there to uh, check in with him to do another a second evaluation. I just didn't want and trust the surgery because I didn't feel that they really knew what all they were wanting to do. Prior to that, I had a tear in my right groin and they had diagnosed it. They had misdiagnosed me with a hernia. And they were actually about to operate with on me for a hernia. And it was a torn muscle. So I was like, I was already on edge with them at that time. Because I'm like, you know, hold on. So I didn't feel comfortable going through the operation on my spine. Were you financially okay at that point in your career? Was that a concern at all? I didn't even think about for as like my career was over my mind didn't even conceive that financially. I, w- I mean, I was fine. I had done really well for myself in the, in the industry. So that wasn't a problem. I wasn't thinking about that. It was just the character and the role that I had known myself to be. And, and really, the, the, I, I, I feel that's really what I was wanting to hold on to, because that's the only thing that I identify with. So when did reality, your new reality set in that you were not going to continue playing? So I set out about a month and through the month, probably month and a half, I started getting some movement. And, you know, again, I'm thinking that I'm like invincible and I can, so I get some movement and I go back. So I was in Dallas. I went, I had a home in Dallas and I I stayed there through the, I had my own quarantine, I call it. And I was going through a lot of reflection. I was isolated because I didn't want people to see me in this situation. So I, I was isolated by myself. I had a lot of time to think and in thinking also began to go through a healing me- a healing process where I began to, I call it just unthaw my body. My body started getting mobile again. And then I went back to Jacksonville and tried to go through rehab to try to get back on the field. And as I was trying to do so, I realized I can go to battle with, with my neck being unpredictable. And so at that time, I realized I'm, I'm done. I'm not going to be able to play anymore. I've heard you talk about a realization that you had where you, you recognized the relationship with your body that you had basically been ignoring for a very long time. Yeah. Well, you know, typically as an athlete, you don't think about relationship with your body. But here's a, another thing. We spend tons of money in the offseason to rehabilitate it, like to heal it. But at that time, still thinking for his relationship, I didn't still think it and consider it as a relationship. I think my mindset, as I see a lot of students I interact with even now, we tend to think relationship starts when it's another person. Mm-hmm. We skip the idea of relationship with ourselves. And so if I had a relationship with myself as an athlete, it was the relationship to push myself 
not mm-hmm. necessarily to listen because I pushed it to limits way beyond I could ever push it to the miles that I ran and still do. But in the hits, I mean, how many times, thousands of times I've jumped in the air and fell on my spine. It's like, you know, it's like, so yeah, it's just a whole revelation of realizing that through the process of healing, I've had to repair those and, mm-hmm. and discover that that personal relationship was going on to create and allow the healing process to take place for me. If you were by yourself and you couldn't really move, how are you negotiating just basic life activities? So I did have someone who was staying at the house who was cooking for me, taking mm-hmm. care of me, moving me around and so forth. I had someone like that. Was that the nurse who told you about breathing? Well, I had another nurse initially with that when I went back to Jacksonville and I was still seeing the doctors and so forth. And she talked to me about breathing. This was someone else that I had hired just to, you know, just to help me do the things I needed to do while I was, you know, in my isolation. Talk about meeting this nurse that told you about breathing, because that kind of that was a pivotal point in your healing. I yeah, feel like. yeah, yeah. And that really for when I had my time in isolation, those are some things that I began to reflect on. She talked to me about breathing when I was in the hospital initially, and I never considered breathing. Like I never thought about it from a principle or fundamental. And I guess by not thinking of it as such, then I couldn't realize it as a tool. But she's like, do you know what happens when you breathe? And she's like, on the inhale, the diaphragm pushes down. On the exhale, it pushes up. So we take about 10,000 breaths a day. And through this process, we have an opportunity to realize certain levels of healing. That was another switch for me because it learned me that I have a tool to help me in the situation. So I wasn't a victim. I I didn't feel like I was a victim because I could participate in my own healing. And that was a whole dynamic that just, just really helped me. I don't, without understanding that, I don't, I don't know where I would have been with that. I've also heard you describe it as sort of like a playbook for your healing. Well, through the process that began to be my initial aspect to my playbook yeah because what you're doing when you breathe first when you think about breathing how i know it and again i didn't know it then but you're talking about the alkalinity so we're talking about ph balance ph we typically know ph as uh, miles per hour mph potential hydrogen is the concept but through the process of breathing it's also a, a processing of of speed is is processing of an experience. So through that process with breathing, I can slow down the experience to gain an understanding of it. And through that understanding, I can gain not only a maturity with it, I can gain a specific concept of articulating my way around it to interpret how I feel with it, how I see it and how I use it. What do you suppose made you open to that, that sort of what we would consider to be alternative healing? Because that doesn't sound like something that you were introduced to prior to that. So why, why do you suppose this particular moment was the moment where you were open to that? Well, I had nothing else. That was all I had. But what I had, though, through that experience, it was all me. It was me. And, and I think, again, I was convinced with the concept of me and that this is what I have, well, this is what I'm going to ride with. You know, it's like if you go to Vegas and you, you know, I'm a bet on me, <laughs> you know, and I, I've, I've, I've done it my whole life. That's been my whole formula, you know. And so if I got something to do with it, well, it's going to get done because I want to be here and I'm not trying to be here average. I'm not trying to be here mundane. I never existed that way. I never thought that way. Even when I didn't know how to articulate it. Now, again, I'm articulating it from a perspective that I know now that I didn't know then. And I'm just putting it all together. But it allowed me the maturity that I didn't have to process it, meaning not to freak out, to have anxiety, like the poor me concept. Even though I did have it, I just didn't stay there very long. And I had something to pull myself out of those situations. 
So, and then I began to realize how I could articulate myself, meaning like that alpha construct of a man is someone who doesn't speak on, I need help. And I, I began to realize to speak on, I need help. I'm not, so when I talk about articulating, I'm not talking about the profound words, I'm talking about simplicity at this time. And it's just basically, I need some help. I need somebody to help me through this. You know, I, this is what I'm just going on with me. I'm having these kind of thoughts. I need this, I'm feeling this. And I began to open those conversations up. Did it work quickly or, or did it take a little while? Well, I didn't have, wow. Like I didn't have, like, again, like, you know, I'm telling you about previous and you talk about college football, you talk about pros, you don't have time. It's like high stressful moments. <laughs> you know, the game is on the line. The more I'm numb, the more potential I can have my nervous system be out of whack, the more potential I have that I could stay in a more restrained or paralyzed state. So I'm looking at every opportunity to gain it as like, this is game time. This is the real game time. My life is on the line. How do I want to be on the planet? And so I didn't have those moments to negotiate. And this is all, this is what I had. And I put it to ultimate test. So you were investing hours each day working on conscious breathing and- one of the things I did a lot in my bedroom, I had the nurse help me with, um, they would put me in pillows with these bunch of pillows. I would be on the floor and I'd be in these different postures, like whether it be a spinal twist. And I would just stay in these postures and just breathe into whatever I was feeling. I don't know where I got this from. I had been in, you know, typical calisthenic stretching, but never putting these things together. I'm not even saying that I knew what it was. I didn't know the concept of yoga at that time, but I was putting myself in these positions and just breathing. And through those experiences, man, I would feel, I would have moments where I would have breakdowns. Like all the things that I had experienced in my body would come up. Just so much would just come up. Sometimes I would break down, start crying. Like, why am I crying? Like, you know, like I just had moments of just being with myself, reflecting. Man, I I think that those were some of the, most interesting moment. I never had moments of reflecting. I've experienced life a million miles an hour, but I never sat down to reflect on it. And through that process, when you mix it in and you incorporate it with your body, it began to open up some channels that I didn't know existed. I know you grew up with, uh, your dad was a preacher. Did you have a spiritual or religious foundation through which you could process these experiences and maybe have language for them? Or did you have books or videos? How are you, how are you processing these experiences? You know, I, I, the Bible and, and things of that nature, I've always challenged it. Even as mm-hmm. a kid, like five years old, I, I, seven years old, I, would, I remember going, standing in front of the church, asking questions that no one had answers for, or they wouldn't they wouldn't dare answer it. <laughs> you know, as, as a kid, I did stuff like that. And so I had a prayer to some extent, you know, kind of like, God, if you let me get through this, man, I, I promise, <laughs> you know, like that kind of prayer, you know, but, but besides that, it was just that. And then here's another thing that really got my attention. Cause I don't, I don't even know if I really, had, besides the books, maybe I skimmed through, you know, but like, really read a book and the book that I got was the art of loving by Eric Fromm. that book kind of lit me up. That book put a whole nother perspective on it. It really started looking at, I started looking at it from a, cause I was very logical at that time. I didn't look at it as a psychology, but I began to even look at it as like, a again, see quarantine is like of a pot. I had my own Vipassana concept. I'm sitting here isolated. And I'm in this moment with myself and it just gains you all these opportunities. So when I got into that book and started looking at the psychology of things, it, it learned me J. Krishnamurti. I began to listen to YouTube takes on him and what he was talking about, contemplation. Man, I'm like, my mind is like, <laughs> it's like all kinds of things started for me. And how long was that healing process until you get regain most of your movement back? It happened in sept- first of September, and I tried to come back end of October, and by November I was back in Dallas. You know, it just put me in that mode. But then, 
and then here's the thing. So when I get back to Dallas in November, some of the old stuff is coming up, like from the standpoint of the religious stuff, like you mentioned. So I'm like, okay, so by this time in November, I got functionality. So I'm like, here's the thing. It's done now. I'm running that fire drill. Like, okay, okay, God got me through this. You know, I need to go to church. Okay, yeah, I need to get married. I got to have a, I gotta get, have a family. You know, I'm starting to do all this kind of panic stuff. And I do all those things. And I, <laughs> I, I, I pick a woman and, you know, I get engaged and we have a child. And, you know, that's not the solution. And, you know, it's just deeper into it. But after that, I go back into the concept of contemplation, meditation, mm -hmm. you know, after experience. So it's like I had to go, I guess, I, like you mentioned, I had to go and live that foundational stuff because that's what you, you typically navigate or migrate back to. And when that doesn't work out, the other thing, I guess, I don't know, but that's, that was my realization. That was my, that's kind of, that was my road. Career-wise, where did you feel like your road was leading you to? I had no idea. I had no idea. I wasn't even thinking of career. I wasn't even thinking of a career at that time. I started thinking of a career more or less when I, when I got my son. My son came and I was engaged. And then I, interesting thing, I started a construction company. I didn't know anything about construction. I had an alum because my A&M is an engineering school. I had an alum from a major commercial construction company just sending me jobs. I developed, I put together a construction company. We were doing the plumbing. I'm like, uh, my first question, which one pays the most? And they said the piping. Okay, that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> I got one of my old teammates from, he was in Dallas at that time with the Cowboys, and he invested with me, and we were just building stuff in Dallas. So we would get all this business, like we were building on like the Cowboy Stadium. I, I had started with, we started with two employees and I, I worked up to 13 full-time employees. And a lot of these guys, master plumbers make 80,000 to 100,000 a year. So I had two of those. And so we had probably five temps. So we had 18 employees, man, and 25,000 square foot office outside of Dallas we we're rolling. And then all of a sudden he just dies out of nowhere. He, he just dies. Two things happened. He, he died and we went through a recession. So those accounts really stopped coming like they were coming. And then we had a recession. So I was like, you know, I had built relationships in the business and I probably could have fought for it, but my heart wasn't there. My, mm -hmm. my heart wasn't there. And then I was having personal issues with my family at that time with, you know, the, the, my engagement and then my child and all these types of things were falling apart. And interesting thing, I was like, this meditation yoga thing, what is that about? Like, I want to go back to that because my mind was clear. My, I was thinking different when I was in that space. And then I met someone, I went for my birthday, I went to a training I think it was a teacher training in White Lotus. Yeah, White Lotus in Santa Barbara for like a 14-day immersion. And I met someone there and she was living in LA and she proposed a question. She's like, why don't you just come to LA? I sold everything and I moved to LA. And that's by around the time I, I met you. And I still wasn't thinking of career. To be honest, I didn't think career or teaching until I met the woman, uh, Sam Isadora started having conversations about teaching. I actually taught my first class with some. You go from making presumably hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of dollars in the NFL to... Millions, millions of dollars. Millions, <laughs> millions of dollars to racking, <laughs> racking it up in construction. Yeah. I'm sure the proposition of being a yoga teacher isn't really... <laughs> I mean, you would be doing that just for your heart and your soul. That would be a paycheck for your soul. Is that how yeah. you looked at it? No, man. I looked at it like... It was a continuation of my healing. Like I was trying to find what I was, what I wanted to create. Like I was like, you know, my identity that for so long was this athlete. And like, I didn't know who I was. I had to learn what did I want Keith to be? Who was this person? So a lot of things, that, which was one of the trickiest things to get over was my ideas about myself and who I was. And, you know, and about, you know, again, that status of being whatever, that didn't serve me no more. That's not going to help me right now. 
and maybe it could have, but I didn't pursue that. That wasn't like, I don't want to go talk about football and be an analyst all day. I'm like, geez, there's more to life than talking about football. I didn't want to do that. That wasn't going to make me happy. I was thinking like, I want to be free. I, I guess I've, I experienced certain levels of freedom through mm -hmm. my meditation, through learning conscious breathing in that moment. And then I think maybe that was just calling me because that's where, I, again, like I did with sports, I bought all in. I committed to it. And so my, my thing with going to L.A. was like, I want to learn with. There's so many, so many teachers there. I want to go learn from. I want to mm -hmm. experience them. And so now I like people like in L.A., actually, I found it outside of L.A. I, started, I saw, found Dr. Sebi, Laila Africa, all these different types of teachers. I would go to their homes. I would pay them to go to their homes and go and just like push record and learn from them, take their courses. I would take their personal courses in their homes. <laughs> I want to talk. I want to talk about that with Dr. Sebi. But before we get to that, mm -hmm. talk about Skid Row. You were exposed to kids on Skid Row and that changed the way you saw your role as a yoga teacher? Oh, man. Like, I think we can live in such a bubble sometimes and we don't even realize the world outside of us existing. It's like, and how it's existing. I never knew. It. I mean, I never knew kids grew up in homeless shelters. And I got called to do this event there and I was meeting these kids. I'm like, it just touched me in a in a way. It's like, I just, it's like I was coming into awakening of this whole life outside of what I've known and this sheltered life. And I was like, wow. And I was like, we got to do something about this. And I, this is also how I became an advocate of doing social type things with my foundation, the Light Up Foundation and so forth. That's probably how and why I started that because I was being exposed to life outside of the bubble that had existed in so long. Who was responsible for getting you down on Skid Row? I forget the name of this particular organization, but I didn't even know Skid Row existed. But we did this event where I had these kids. They were like, I think the youngest was around five. And I think the oldest was like around like 14, 15. And we did a yoga deal with the kids. We had them separate. And I had a football, I brought a football out. And I would, what I would do, I taught them the concept of true north to stand in your true north and like to speak your truth and their truth. What do you want to be when you grow up? And then what I added the football piece to it, I would throw them a pass, right? I'd throw them a pass, whoever raised their hand, they catch the pass, they stand in the true north and they speak their desires of what they wanted to be and where they saw themselves. Like, again, I guess I'm taking it from my coach. What do you see mm -hmm. yourself in five years and so forth? So it really just touched me, man. And changed my life. And, so many things in LA changed my life and really shaped me to what I am now. And so it was just a continuation, which led to the, the, the mindful 5k event that you came to mm -hmm. at the Coliseum. Like, you know, people in the community looking at me, like I'm crazy. Like, are you, how is this guy going to pull this off? How are you not going to come on? What we've been here forever and we ain't done nothing like that. So how are you going to, you know? And I'm like, I was just so that started from being in my first retreat. I'm like, LA needs to retreat for the community. Like, you know, I'm like thinking like that in my mind. But at the same time, I also have a business mind. I come from a place of knowing how to execute business. And, and like I said earlier, I negotiated my first contract in the pros. So I'm also familiar with negotiating, sitting at tables where big money is taking place. And so in that event, we raised half a million dollars. You've yeah. also said that we especially like the wellness community, we tend to think small in nonprofit spaces, but we think big in for-profit spaces. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, for some reason, I think maybe because we feel, you know, and I can get it, I, I, I get it. Sometimes we think, who do we think we are when we want to put a staple into the world and say, we need to do it this way or this can be corrected. And so maybe we go and minimize our opinions about certain things. But I, I'm apparently not that way because <laughs> I've never thought small and I don't believe this is the time to think small. And so I always thought big. And that's why I named my foundation, the Light Up Foundation, because I realized I started seeing like how all these organizations are doing the same thing. But because they're in competition for the same money, they don't associate with each other. But I'm like, well, how are we ever going to build if we're all on our 
you know, in our private places, it reminds me of being in the pros because in the pros, you're always looking for your edge. And mm -hmm. so, so you may learn a new tra training regimen or a healing regimen. You just keep to yourself because it's doing so much for you. You're like, I don't want them to know about it. You know, it seems like that. And so I'm like, no, we can bring this thing together and we can divvy up. Cause in that half a million dollars, what we did, we divvied the money up to the organizations that participated. So they all made money. My goal with that was just kind of showing how we could think in a different way to get all the things that we want and then also make even more progress moving it together. And talk about the mission of the Light Up Foundation. You know, the Light Up Foundation is just bringing awareness. You know, when you think of light and our, our logo at that time was a stage and we could bring light to kind of where we may not see the situation, like thinking about when I first saw the children in the homeless shelters and so forth. Again, so many people I acknowledge are in these bubbles and that's fine, but let's bring this to light so we can, or certain things to light so we can see it. And I feel we're here to solve problems. You know, I live by the method that life has no meaning. We give meaning to life. And so through the experience that we have, the traumas that we go through, we begin to be the PhD to suggest our experience, to speak about it authentically, to share it. And that gives space for the next person who's experienced what we've experienced to say, oh, well, then if you did it, then I can do it. So we're the medicine. So in that dynamic, the Light Up Foundation was just that concept to do that in a, in a big way where we could bring allies in throughout the communities. We did that event in New York as well as LA to create some really magical things together. So when you and I first spent some one-on-one -on -one time together, we went out for dinner and I remember you ordered a burger yeah, and, and I got some kind of vegetarian stuff because I was vegan at the time. Mm -hmm. And then next thing I know, I see you posting these clips of being in Honduras. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, this dude just keeps going. Is he going for dental work? Like, what's he going to Honduras for? <laughs> did get some dental work. <laughs> <laughs> So talk about your experiences with Dr. Sebi. Oh, man. You know, I was looking at YouTube videos and I saw Lisa Left Eye Lopez and she was talking about her journey. Mm -hmm. And she was in Honduras in the Amazon. And then she mentioned Dr. Sebi. And then Dr. Sebi came on and he was talking about Usha Village. And I was like, I just knew I had to get there. I just knew I had to meet him. I knew this was a portion of my life that was missing that I didn't know about. And it was nutrition and how to feed and nourish the regenerational process, the healing process that I needed to take place in my body and my life. And so I ventured off to Honduras and man, forever. Had, you, had you contacted him before you went or you decided I'm going to go there and just go knock on his door? What was the process? No, I, I reached out to the his how he had it structured through his businesses. He had an office in L.A. So I went through that office and I found my way to La Ceiba. It was like planes, trains and automobiles. And I landed in the Amazon. And one of the first things Dr. Sebi mentioned to me that humans cannot process animal DNA. And it was like a like a like a, a ding that went on in my mind. And I was like, wow, OK. This is what it is. And I began the process of alkaline veganism. And through that process, I began to reap the benefits of it. And again, not to just speak about it, but to live it. And, and I probably have taken you know, a couple hundred people to Honduras to experience the healing, including my mother, who was diagnosed with stage three breast cancer. And my mother was cured in like three months at the age of 60 when she had breast cancer. And uh, now she's 66 and she's healthy, no cancer. You've mentioned a few times this sort of alpha male archetype with your father, with certain coaches. What was your impression of Dr. Sebi when you laid eyes on him in that regard? Man, you know, Dr. Sebi was just like, I mean, he was just one of those types of people you just sit and listen the knowledge that he had. You just didn't want to waste the time of, you know what you know. I want to know what he knows. I came this way to know what he knows. And so I just sat and listened. And I and whatever he told me to do, I did it. And I I, I began to just, just learn from him. 
And I, like I said, I've been to his home probably 10 times. Dr. Sebi, at that time, when I first got to Honduras, first time, his youngest daughter was three years old. And his oldest child was, I think, 60, 22 kids. And he was, he was in his 80s at that time still, I guess. I'm like, whatever he's doing, I don't want to have kids, but I still want to be in the game. So I'm like, he's got, he's a master and, and so many facets of, of living. And so how can I learn from him? What was his house like? Were there like concoctions and experiments and stuff happening all over the place? Or was it pretty minimal or? No, you know, he had this compound that he came up with in the eighties, man. As you talk mm-hmm. about sustainable living, uh, it's called Usha Village. And it's the, it's the mother, you know, it's the Usha is the mother. In this concept, he had alkaline water. It comes out of the, the vein of the volcano at 9.6, 9.7 alkalinity. Mm. I've seen people just drink that water, bathe in that water every day, and their health change. I saw so many people by being there, just their, their health, just like, like just in a couple of days, just revamp. So I was convinced. I, and so, and then I also brought so many people there that, again, their lives changed, their vegans, their, their bodies, their health, whatever their pathology was, is, you know, is corrected now. It convinced me on the fact that we are fueling our consciousness with the things that we intake in our bodies. And so it's something that we have to pay attention to. So Dr. Sabi was like, I'm blessed to have, have been an understudy of of some of the amazing work that he's done. Is your mom still plant-based? My mom is still plant-based. My mom has been there twice. Mm. So by my mom following the, the directions, I, I, I took her there to meet him. I've taken my mother, father, and sister there. My father and sister have been there once. My mother has been there twice. That's quite a testimonial for someone to go from stage three to being completely remiss and balanced and everything like that. So I'm sure everyone in Garland, Lakeview, <laughs> wherever they live right now, wants to or wanted to go see Dr. Yeah. Sabi. Yeah, you know, the very interesting thing what I noticed with my mother, and we've, you know, I think one of the most things I'm grateful for is through the process, I've taken my family on the journey with me. So we've been able to kindle a really in-depth relationship to, to have these types of discussions and like to, to go in on some of these things, a whole lot of these things that we've had to deal with. What I noticed with my mother through that process, because again, church is such the, the, the concept that we live under. One of the hardest things she had to deal with was explaining her revelation of her healing. I noticed that she had a really hard time mentally conceptualizing that she did something to help her heal or cure her of her illness. And it wasn't something that we've been told it to be like as God as being the healer. She didn't have to wait on God. She initiated her healing and she was healed. So she had a lot of complications telling her testimony. I noticed that very interesting when it came to that. But my mother's, man, I'm so grateful for her. And I think, you know, when we talk about love, we talk about these things that are so sacred that we feel are so sacred to us. Wellness is the greatest gift you can give anybody that you feel you love. One of the reasons I was asking so much about playbooks at different stages in your life is because you've now developed a mindful playbook, literally. Mm-hmm. Like you do, you've delivered a book yeah. where you can give people the steps, the blueprint on how to do this. Talk a little bit about the genesis of the mindful playbook and where it is right now. The mindfulness playbook is basically an integration of like whether it be a Buddhist concept or just an overall perspective of like, how, how can I live? How can I live and gain the vitality that I want, the possibility that I desire, all the things that you really desire in this life, right? And also be accountable for yourself. It's like so many times we, we want to search out the guru, we want to search out the teacher, and we got some amazing teachers like, you know, like yourself in the world. However, there's a lot of things that we've experienced ourselves that we haven't really given ourselves a true understanding of realizing there's a lot of intel there. And I want to, and I feel through this process, this concept, I can help you gain your attributes to what you've experienced and bring those to the forefront 
So now when you're engaging in things that begin to be confrontational or things that challenge you, you have some basic tools that you can navigate for yourself. Uh, Mm -hmm. You can stand in for yourself and see life change for you. It's like kind of like a code that you live by. And in Mm -hmm. this code, you stay on it. And your interactions with other people, you stay on this code and things just work out more strategically, more constructional instead of the opposite of that. So that's the premise around this book. And I think it's going to help a lot of people. I'm looking forward to seeing the, um, you know, the people's response to it. You mentioned something in another interview that I listened to that I found very interesting. You talked about the importance of redefining terms. Mm. Yeah. And that's how you open the book. Yeah. Yeah. What what do you mean by that? Well, a lot of things, like even when we talk about alpha male, what is an alpha male? It's just really, you know, we're stressing the fact that this male has gone through a lot of things that's un, unexplained that we couldn't unexplain. We couldn't explain. And we've been, we've, we've made ourselves strong to go through it. And so it's an opportunity to look at that. And that, res, that resilience is, is necessary to a point. It's allowed us to move through these things. However, uh, there's some more developmental aspects that can take place for that male. And what does that look like? So now I can come out of the alpha, let go of the hurt and just be the mature male the expanded version of the male, or you have wife, or you have a uh, single mother, you have all these terms that we've taken on. And by taking on these terms, we take on the burden in which we've learned these terms. So we begin to, if we're speaking spells into the world, if the, the world, if the words we use are landing us in these places, well, what do these places look like? Are they defined by me? Are they defined by outside sources? And do I mm-hmm. want that? So now I can, because words are meant to be tools not to be our jail cells (laughs) or our limitations. So it's like hip hop did it, you know, it turned bad into good and the world had to catch up to it. It's Mm -hmm. the next level thinking. It's a whole concept that I, I feel that can really land us into these places of what we want to accomplish and, and a strategic opportunity to gain these ways that we can get to it. That's beautiful. And you also talked about yoga being less of a series of movements and more of a principle. Yeah. Yoga, you know, it's like a growth and development. It's like everything that you want someone else to experience with you or you want to do to them is you establishing it with yourself. If you speak of patience, well, let's establish patience for ourselves. Give yourself a chance to develop and move and put your body in a position where it can open up and gain more access, more space around the heart. You know, if it's, if it's compassion, if it's patience, well, we begin to realize these principles to, in another sense, reincarnate ourselves in this experience that we get to partake in every day to get out and to know how we did it this one way and to come back and do it even better the next day. Not that we're comparing ourselves to another person, but we're comparing ourselves to the effort in which we put into it. And that effort doesn't mean just gaining and going through it and doing every posture correctly. That effort is also giving yourself permission to take breaks, relax, Mm. and allow yourself the steps of of developing. So I, I share the practice like that. It's a relationship piece. When can we get our hands on this book, man? You know, that's been the thing. And um, we got some, you know, politics that we got to play with it. But it's going to be an audio. Uh, it's going to be an audio. It's going to be obviously the hard copy ebook. Trust me, I'm trying to get it out ASAP. <laughs> you know, <laughs> no one wants it out faster than you, right? Exactly. <laughs> but also realizing how hard it is writing a book, man. It's it's a challenge. Like you've written three, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you wrote right? it yourself. Yeah, I had support though. I had mm-hmm. I had some people, you know, obviously the editors and and so forth, but. Um, yeah, it's it's work, but I would have liked it to come out obviously sooner. But however, it's going to be right on time. What was it like negotiating a book deal versus an NFL contract? Oh, it was much easier, <laughs> much easier. Because you know the thing is that what I looked at, and I looked at the key components that I was missing, and I was wanting more of. Because as we've been in the business for, I don't know seven years now, however long it's been. Mm -hmm. I don't advertise. I don't call people. Hey, do you want to work with me? (laughs) You know, I just respond to emails. It's manifestation. It's using one of the most profound energies that we have. This is why I'm in, one of the reasons why I'm in Mexico, Intimacy Mastery 2. 
because we've talked a lot about the words we use and the thoughts and mindsets, right? However, that's not the most powerful energy we have. And so there's another dynamic on top of that. So what happens when we compound those two together? So now a lot of these companies and organizations and situations have come to me because it's a concept of magnetism that we can tap into, which is just another superpower that we have that uh, we really hadn't even scratched the surface on. I'm looking forward to just getting all these concepts out and just making it, I have this idea of just how can we bring heaven down to earth? So I want, my focus is fundamentally simplicity, where just the person who just has a curiosity can just digest it and, and take it in and, and use it, implement it in their lives and their day-to-day practice. I have two more questions for you. The first one is, how do you define success these days? There's a lot of levels to success. There's, it's all about what, what you want, what you want to create. And if it's coming to, like, if you set a tier here, like, say, at a level five, and that's what you want, and that's a way of, that's an idea of success. And then another success I have from a definitional standpoint is, uh, how does it make you feel? If you notice how I've said it's all isolated into how you feel, you think, mm-hmm. not based off of other people. Coach Dicker had a, a quote. You talked about father concept and the quotes. My coach, football coach, had this he's saying, he's like, don't read the tabloids, don't read the papers. And I still don't read the papers. I still really don't read the articles because he says, you're not as bad or as good as they say you are. So if you never buy into it, you just, it just is. And so mm-hmm. that's the same thing when it comes to success. Well, my idea of success is how does it make me feel? And was it when I put out and set out to do it, did it meet the criteria? Did it meet my standard? And it's all based on me, not on someone else validating my work. I don't give anybody that power over me. Obviously, I want people to appreciate it and like have an experience with it. However, it's based off of how it's making me feel. If you were able to go back to 18-year-old Keith and whisper some words of wisdom <laughs> into his ear, what would, you, what would you say to him? Well, I would say to him, enjoy it. You know, I don't think I didn't really take time to really enjoy it. I I think I was in such a rush to prove stuff. And and I guess that's why my my definition of success is so different now, because I was trying to prove to the world certain things. And even though I did in certain facets, but it didn't give me an opportunity to really enjoy it because it was always the next thing. You know, Mm. (laughs) the NFL is like, we have this saying, uh, you know, not for long or (laughs) <laughs> we also, you know, we we also take that uh, Janet Jackson song, What Have You Done For Me Lately? You know, that's how the approach is with teams and their expectations of your performances. So I was kind of caught up in that circle. And since I got into this new way of being, I just allow it. It's not that I'm not intentional. It's not that I don't plan and, and, and create and prepare. However, I mean, that's not moving me. That's not, I don't have, I don't live by those pressures, man. You know, I want to enjoy this thing. We have one opportunity that we know of to experience this life. So I want to, I want to love hard. I want to experience hard. I want to be able to take it all in, whatever that looks like. That's why I'm in Mexico. Someone says, where's your mask? I'm like, I'm not in Mexico to wear a mask. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's why I came to Mexico. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, look, man, what, one of the things that I like to do at the end of these conversations is kind of tie it back to childhood. Your connection is pretty obvious with the football, but I think it, we can go a couple of layers deeper than that. You know, and one of the images that I keep going back to in my mind as I hear your story is of you throwing the ball up in the air and catching it by yourself and having that vision and having that drive to overcome all of the objections that you were getting from really the biggest presence in your life, which was your own parents and dedicating yourself to doing whatever you had to do to be able to compete at the highest level. And a part of that is understanding systems, understanding playbooks, And so I feel like that's what you've been doing, you know, and in a way, 
all of that experience was really just preparing you for what you're doing right now. Because anybody who's doing anything of note, whether it's writing a book, you know, doing retreats during a pandemic, starting a foundation, whatever, there's going to be a lot of people who have something to say about all of that. And you have to be able to see yourself not being drafted and get up and go and try anyway, because life is not in life. You don't get picked most of the time. <laughs> right. So your story, man, of coming back from being paralyzed and just all of the things and learning how to heal yourself and, and bringing your mom into that community and just everything that I've witnessed you doing is just, you're very, you're very, you're one of the most inspiring people that I know. And I, I'll, I'll be transparent here. You know, I also learn from you to think bigger when it comes to nonprofit stuff mm. as well. You know, when I was at your 5k, I was like, damn, this, this thing is <laughs> huge. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, how did he do that? How do you pull that off? And then yeah. I talked to you and you were like, yeah, this person donated $75,000 and this person sponsored 25,000. I was like, wow, is this, I was expecting like $2,000 numbers, $500 yeah. numbers. Cause that's what I was used to. So thank you for helping to be that example for me and all the stuff that I've done. And uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm just grateful to be able to call you a friend and it's always, always love when I run into you. So thank you so much for being a part of this this oh, experience. I, I appreciate those words. I take all that in and, and you're a great inspiration as well, man. And just, I mean, laying the foundation when I, when I met you, I'm like, who's it? Light walk from what? Light. Okay. Okay. You know, just doing it. And I, I, I really appreciate that, man. And this presence and what you bring to the community, man. So I give it back to you, man. Appreciate you. You've been an inspiration to me as well. So I'm, I'm thanks for having me be a part of this, looking for great things to continue to come your way. Beautiful. Thank you so much, brother. Thank you for listening to my conversation with Keith Mitchell. I highly recommend following Keith's work on social media. You can find him at Keith Mitchell 59. That's at Keith Mitchell 59. And we'll look out for Keith's mindfulness playbook. And if you felt inspired by hearing Keith's transformational story, I truly appreciate it if you could take just 10 seconds to rate this podcast. Just look down at your screen and click where it says at the end of the tunnel in purple. And if you're not listening to this on an Apple podcast app, look for a button that says listen on Apple podcast. And once you get to the podcast feed, scroll down past all of my previous episodes to where it says ratings and reviews and just tap the star all the way on the far right and you've left the review. That's it. It's that simple. So thank you for that. I truly appreciate it. And I appreciate you. Oh, and you can also get the show notes and a transcript of my interview with Keith at lightwatkins.com slash tunnel. While you're there, don't forget to sign up for my daily dose of inspiration email, which is a short and sweet daily motivational message that I've been sending out every morning for years. It's been turned into a book called Knowing Where to Look, 108 Daily Doses of Inspiration, which is out in May of 2021. Thanks again for listening to this podcast and for sharing it with your friends and your followers. I'll see you back here next week with another amazing story from the end of the tunnel. And in the meantime, keep trusting your intuition, keep following your heart, peace and love. 